Hello, this is Father Gregory Pine, and welcome back to Off Campus Conversations here on the Thomistic Institute podcast, where we follow up with TI speakers who will have lectured uh, on campus or at a conference or at an intellectual retreat and chase down some insights or just simply continue the conversation. So for this installment, I am delighted to be joined by Professor Raymond Hain from Providence College. Thanks so much for joining. Thanks for having me. Um, so people may know you from other TI talks that you have given. Uh, at one point, you were going to give a talk at the University of Maryland called Literature as Philosophy, but weather, uh, I suppose, delays or cancellations made it impossible. And I think that was one of the first TI talks that I ever gave because the University of Maryland isn't too terribly far from the Dominican House of Studies. And so I, yes, said random things <laughs> in patchwork fashion, a pastiche of truths with no methodology. Uh, but you have succeeded in giving other Thomistic Institute talks, which required less in the way of kind of cobbling together and recovering. Uh, but would you just say a word of introduction, who you are, where you're from, and what you do? Absolutely. Uh, thanks again for having me. So I uh, teach at Providence College in Rhode Island, which is the uh, college of the East Eastern Province Dominicans. So I'm delighted to uh, have a lot of your brothers around uh, all the time up here at Providence College. Uh, I'm in the philosophy department, but I also help run the humanities program at Providence College, which uh, does a lot of things. It has some degree programs, both in the humanities, the interdisciplinary studies, uh, and in Catholic studies. We run a conference. Uh, we've started a Rome program. We've done all kinds of great stuff. Um, and it's been a great place to be. I've been here for 13 years or so. Uh, and my specialty is um, ethics, Aquinas, uh, philosophy and literature, Alexis de Tocqueville. Uh, I do a lot of things that um, bring together different disciplines, partly because of the Development of Western Civilization program, which is the heart of an education at Providence College and is a four semester uh, great books program that's existed uh, for about 50 years or so. Uh, so it's, it's great to be here, uh, and it's great to be uh, coming in from the school of, of your province, Father Gregory. Yeah. Um, I, th I thought that maybe we could talk a bit about the humanities. Um, Why well, talk about something when you could talk about everything? Um, and specifically, right, so thinking of students on campus or thinking about teachers, pedagogues, trying to kind of pull together their curricula, or just thinking about the interested learner who's trying to be deliberate in his or her approach to the study of truth or sacred truth. Um, I think that, that sometimes people, you know, they have the experience where they're, they're trying to like lay hold of whatever it is that we're trying to approach here, like the Western tradition or the Catholic intellectual tradition, and they just don't know how to get purchased. They don't know where to find a handle. It just seems so huge and monolithic and thereby imposing even menacing. Um, and I think that sometimes people are like, ah, yeah, I know what I'll do. I'll just read this list of great books because a list affords me a modicum of control. And then I can just progress through it over the course of the next however many years. Um, but many people have the experience rather early on that like the material cause is not sufficient to give shape or to give coherence to their approach. Like they need something in the way of encouragement or they need something in the way of prompting. How do you, when kind of broaching the subject, you know, I teach humanities and say like a STEM type person says, you know, the only thing that matters in this world is engineering. Like, how do you, how do you present this and how do you afford people an entry into this type of discipline? Mm, that's a great question, Father Gregory. Uh, you know, I'm going to, let me start a little bit further back than maybe you were expecting when you asked, asked the question. Uh, late 19th century, first half of the 20th century, Catholic education was really shaped by the Thomistic revival. And we had a nice controlled curriculum, lots of philosophy, lots of theology. Uh, it built up, it gave you the picture of the Thomistic synthesis. And that broke down in the middle of the 20th century and has been replaced in many respects by a sort of great books, humanistic, um, something that includes history and literature, especially, and not just philosophy and theology. Uh, and it's still it's still working its way out. How how does it work? How do you how do you avoid just a menu of texts? Uh, there's a great you, I'm sure you know the uh, St. John's program, uh, well known great book school. Uh, there's a famous line that people come out of that school either skeptics or Christians, uh, and that there's something about the reading list itself that is ambiguous, uh, that's maybe unformed even. 
So I think partly your question is really relevant for us today because the, the Catholic tradition is trying to figure out what its new mode of education is uh, over the last 50 years or so. And the developments in Catholic studies have been quite uh, exciting. They tend to be humanistic in the sense that you're describing. They tend to be interdisciplinary, to be great books focused, to find a, a see a, a really rich place for literature and for history, uh, as well as philosophy and theology. Uh, and then, now let's come to your question. How do you talk to a student uh, what, what would you say to a student about what the humanities is doing, uh, what you should read and how you should read it? Uh, to me, the single most important individual, single most important aspect of an education for a student is the human being who's helping them think about their education. So this is a very uh, John Henry Newman thought to have that the texts are crucial, but the most important thing is the person who's in front of the student. So what do you, you said, uh, I like the way, nice Aristotelian formulation, is the material cause uh, sufficient or how should we think about that? And the answer, of course, is the formal cause is what's crucial and in certain respects, the final cause as well. And the formal cause, we might consider simply the teacher who's doing the teaching. And the teacher brings to every book he or she's reading or presenting to a student a certain um, tradition, a certain perspective, a certain animating principle that gives you not just a way of interpreting the text, but a way of evaluating it. Now, that doesn't mean that the teacher just tells the student what to think. That would be a mistake. But the teacher has to express, convey to the student, here's how, here's how I'm thinking about this text. Here's how my life is enlivened by what we're reading and shaped in certain respects. Uh, and in a, in a way, hopefully, you know, in a Catholic education, in a way that's sensitive to the true, the good, and the beautiful. Uh, so how, now you, you start, you ended your question by saying, how do you talk to somebody who's in STEM? Who's in, how do you get them interested in the humanities? There's a lot of possible responses. If I just had sort of one or two sentences, I'd probably say, you know, STEM tells you a lot about how the world works, but the humanities help you think about what to love. And that's going to be the most important thing that you learn in your life. Yeah. Um, yeah I, as you went through the different parts of my question, I realized that I asked like seven questions in kind of undisciplined <laughs> fashion, thereby modeling a good education and formation. It's like, and I had this thought and that thought, and look, there's a squirrel. And also, um, okay, so it's, it strikes me that, you know, placing a certain emphasis on the educator, uh, qua pedagogue, right? So one who adduces from the student a kind of series by a series of images and by a series of uh, kind of prompted discoveries, as it were, um, a greater appreciation of what is and helps uh, that student to, to formulate judgments as to what is and how it is. It strikes me that like when, when shaping a curriculum and then leading somebody through that curriculum, there are a lot of judgments to be made. And our culture is kind of judgment averse uh, for whatever reason, right? So judgment averse kind of backing away from, you know, you, sh you, you could think this or you could think that, but I'm not going to tell you what to think. It strikes me that um, in that relationship, there has to be a kind of trust. There has to be a kind of like witness factor almost whereby you can lead another person to make judgments in responsible fashion without thereby becoming like a guru uh, that the other person just wants to kind of fawn over or ingratiate himself with so as to, you know, dot, dot, dot. Okay. So like, how do you, like what kind of judgments are brought to bear in this type of environment and how are you responsible in formulating those judgments and then helping your students to make those judgments as to, you know, like what's important as to what counts as to how to shape my life and, and how to live? Yeah. What a great, that's a great question. That's another maybe seven to 14 questions. <laughs> think, sorry, Gregory. Uh, let me, let me, let's see, let me make a, a, a start here at least. Um, Yeah, how do you form the judgment of a student? I think there's a lot of layers to talk about here. One is that as a teacher, you your life is on display for the students. And the students are seeing in you, hopefully, a combination of theory and practice or of the intellectual life and the moral life. Um, you should ideally be interested in the daily lives of your students. They should, they should see you outside of class. 
this is, again, this is a model that uh, John Henry Newman, St. John Henry Newman was very enthusiastic about. So what's the first thing to think about? That you are, um, you are a model for your students of a life that integrates the riches of the humanistic and Catholic tradition with, with living, with life, with a lived experience. Um, and that's, that's, a bit of, that's a bit of a heavy burden in some respects, but in, in other respects, it's, it's to be expected. Um, I'll give you an example. Uh, I, I'm a philosopher by training, and much of what I teach is not theological. Uh, I, I tend, I don't always do this because some classes at Providence College are team taught, but in my own classes, I tend to begin with a prayer, not because I'm teaching uh, theology that day or might have any particular connection to theological thought in the class as a whole, but because just that moment, and it's very short and, and passes quickly, that tells the students a great deal about the kind of person I am. And that's crucial, I think. So one thing to say, um, that your life is one of the things that's teaching uh, for the students in your classroom. Uh, now, how else do you help them uh, have good judgment? Uh, I think a lot of what you're doing in the classroom is just helping them um, understand the perspectives of others, to see what a text might be saying, uh, to see what's uh, compelling about it. If it's an argumentative text, to be able to follow the argument and judge whether or not it's a good one. Um, I tend to think that the most, the most important form of judgment that students need nowadays is not so much about whether or not an argument's good, but whether or not something is worthy of being desired or worthy of being loved. Um, and that's harder to teach, that kind of judgment. Uh, I think the, the role of, let's say, if we're thinking about the transcendentals, truth, beauty, and goodness, I think the transcendental of beauty is particularly important today because it helps students to desire the right kinds of things. So how do you, how do, you do that? Well, partly you're showing them things that are that are beautiful, and that can uh, that can draw them into something that they hadn't expected. Uh, just recently, uh, with some colleagues of mine, I taught uh, a, a kind of group of things centered on the Holocaust, and we ended up teaching three films. They were very different films. Uh, one of them was a recent one, Zone of Interest, which just came out this semester, and it's a hard film to watch. It's a, it's from the perspective of the perpetrators of the Holocaust. Um, but we also made them watch Life is Beautiful, which is a 1990s Italian film. <clears throat> and that film, it's a comedy drama about the Holocaust. And that seems uh, challenging in its own way. How could you have a, a movie that's partly comic? Uh, but part of the lesson of that movie is that no matter, no matter the suffering that's before you, the human spirit can rise above that suffering and can't be completely crushed by the forces uh, of darkness. And that's a very important thing to help a student see. Um, not that that all by itself will shape their judgment, but they have in their minds an example of someone's life that, um, that managed to persevere, <clears throat> to, remain, to remain hopeful in the face of great evil. Uh, and having those images with them it shapes their ability to make judgments in the future. Yeah. Um, okay, so again, I'm thinking of a thousand things. Um, I've noticed, you know, thinking about it in terms of truth and then transitioning in terms of goodness and beauty. In terms of truth, I've noticed that, uh, you know, like, I mean, many people have noticed that public, public discourse is kind of breaking down insofar as it, it doesn't seem too terribly committed to rational exchange. It's kind of like person X said Y. Well, I am not person X, decidedly so, so I'm going to say not why. It's kind of by way of reaction or aversion. And so like our primary modes of communication are like mockery or protest or irony or just primal screams, whatever it is. Uh, but we don't seem too terribly interested in, you know, learning the principles, engaging the arguments and working our way to a kind of corporate consideration of, you know, what is. Um, but you've, you've emphasized now in a couple of questions this idea of love like kind of communicating to the student what's worthy of him or her or helping the student to engage with what, what actually, you know, is perfected, represents final cause, the type of things which, which build us up. Um, now, I've, I've noticed like this generation, it seems to me, this generation being generation currently in college is a 
it seems a kinder generation than my generation. Like niceness is a value for this generation in a way in which it wasn't as much a value for my generation. Um, and so there's like a kind of baseline sympathy. Uh, but I wonder about like whether there's a genuine love. So I think often of this, you know, this, this priest, Father Vincent McNabb, who lived in the beginning of the 20th century, his friends, G.K. Chesterton. And he says, if you don't love the world, you can't preach to the world. So if you're constantly like uh, inveighing against the world or condemning the world, that it, you're like you're at a certain distance from your auditors. And as a result of which, you don't really have anything to give them. And so there's a way in which like love you know, like opens up a kind of avenue of communication. And I just wonder, like, how do you communicate a genuine sympathy, like a deeper sympathy, a sympathy that goes beyond, you know, trying to navigate difference and avoid the accusation of whatever, like intoler intolerance or bigotry? Like, how do you how do you cultivate a genuine love for what is in pedagogical fashion or, you know, as an educator? Yeah, that's a great question or or more than one. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, there's a lot of things I could talk about in connection with this, but let me talk about the activity of attention mm. that is focusing on someone or something uh, in a way that that allows a, a real connection with that thing. I think attention uh, is both a real challenge for us today, and you know, as as kind as this generation might be, technology makes attention very uh, both precious. And, and more scarce maybe than it used to be. But I think attention is crucial. So let me talk about this in a couple ways. Um, the most important way, I think, is that in order to convey the kinds of things I'm thinking about, you need to give attention to particular people. That is, and you know, in the professions, it's very easy to speak to someone and be unable to convey to them that they are the most important person in your life at this second because you're directly connected to them and speaking to them. Um, that's hard to do. It's something I always admired from, there's a story about John Paul II that whenever you were talking to him, <clears throat> it was like you were all that mattered to him. He was completely focused on you as a person. And I think that's something a good teacher tries to do. Um, if I think about the greatest, the two greatest teachers in the West, Socrates and Jesus, who didn't write anything, uh, they influenced by being in a particular relationship with their disciples, with their followers. And uh, there's no doubt in my mind that they gave those people their attention, their focus. And by doing that with students, you're teaching them. You're showing them that um, there's a particular kind of relationship between people that is uh, rich, that is fruitful, um, and that is an expression of the love that we're trying to talk about. So I think that's crucial, um, thinking about attention, attention, attention directed at people. But it's also true of all kinds of things. Uh, students have trouble reading nowadays, <clears throat> reading extended books. It, there's just not as much of a culture of that uh, since the last 20 years or so. So students have to develop the attention to focus, to give time to an extended argument, extended text. When you're talking about, you know, the, the beginning of your comment was thinking about our culture today where it's easier um, and more common even perhaps not to think about the arguments, but just to think about the side that you are most likely to be connected to and then just to go for that side. That's partly a, a challenge of attention. It takes a lot of effort and focus and time to really think about the arguments to say, okay, I, you know, here's what I heard, but I'm going to, I'm going to really think seriously about what's at stake here. Um, I think, I mean, to a large extent in, in a humanities classroom, you're teaching students to, um, to really spend time thinking through a particular position. This is especially true of positions that you don't agree with, I think. Um, as well as positions that, that are sympathetic to you, and to really spend the time to think through the argument and to see where it leads you. Uh, and that's a great deal. That takes up a lot of um, the time that a humanities class uh, makes use of. How do you give your attention to things, uh, people first, and then arguments, ideas, um, books, uh, and what can come from that? I was just teaching in... Uh, the Cardinal's, Cardinal Virtues class yesterday about prayer. 
And St. Thomas talks about attention in prayer, and he says, first, you know, you've got your baseline with intention. Uh, so the meritorious quality of prayer is dictated by intention. So you say, you know, I'm going to pray for 20 minutes in the pleasant presence of the Blessed Sacrament. You know, that merits, uh, regardless of what transpires uh, between the moment that you sit down or kneel down and then the moment that you stand up. And then he says, within intention, then we can speak of attention. And he says, you pay attention to words and to the sense of the words and to the end of the words with God in mind. Um, and so there's a sense in which, you know, for, for good authors, if you intend and attend, they'll always reward you because they give access to reality. Um, and I think that that's, you know, people can, can get real good at, at mastering this thinker's thought about this thing. Uh, but when you can, in a humanities classroom, mediate this encounter with reality, then it motivates itself. Uh, and, and so then, yes, you know, it's, it's, it's worthwhile to curate a list of, of better authors and best authors, because there are just some figures in the tradition who are especially wise, uh, who are especially gifted at mediating this encounter with reality, because they, they gazed upon reality, they gazed upon God and reality with such acuity, with such sympathy, with such insight, that it facilitates your encounter with a kind of, yeah, I don't know exactly how to describe it, but yeah, with a kind of ease. Um, so thinking about that in the setting of in the setting of a humanities classroom, uh, so you are consulting the great pedagogues, acting yourself as a pedagogue, facilitating an encounter with reality as you know the texts, you know assist you in that. Um, so, and and we've talked to you know already a little bit about about motivating it and then about kind of executing it. Um, but are there are there I don't know like special dimensions or are there particular skills that you as a pedagogue deploy in then like communicating it as it were in the sense of like this person's going to have to not only be sufficiently motivated to get an A in the class but to take the next class and maybe even to prize this for you know his children in the next generation because as the cost of education increases and as people make decisions about university or trade school or you know for higher education or otherwise you know like it's there's a kind of urgency to it you know and i think a lot of educators feel that especially those working in the liberal arts like there's there's an urgency not just because you want to have a job in however many years but because it's like the very basis of our society <laughs> seems seems to be founded there upon so yeah, are there are there further things to be described there along those lines when it comes to like not only communicating the vision but communicating, yeah, the love, the the urgency that comes with that. Yeah, that's a great. And I'm gonna I'm gonna take that question as kind of a question like the following. Okay. Why should why should we care about the liberal arts uh, yeah. today? I mean, college is very expensive, without a doubt. It's it's getting more expensive, which seems from my my perspective hard to sustain, but nevertheless, it's happening. Um, and students are understandably anxious about, uh, about their career preparation and so on. So how, do, how does a person in the humanities, uh, how do we think about that? You know, the, the, part of my work at Providence College has been to develop programs for students that they can integrate into their vocational preparation, say if they're business students or nursing students. Uh, and mostly how I speak to them is, um, you need a way <clears throat> you need a way to connect the practical parts of your life the professional parts of your life to the deepest the deepest aspects of human reality you need a way to think about that and you may not be a humanities major and that's fine uh, but you need to take some classes that help you reflect on what matters most in life um, what it will take for you to be happy uh, what's worth loving, what's worth desiring, uh, how you can decide, you know, how you can think carefully about the place of material material wealth in your life. Um, all those things, college is, for most students, college is the most focused, the best opportunity to really think about that in a concentrated way. And and students need that. Now, how do you, if, if I were to give that speech to a student, would they say, oh, let me take your class? Maybe, uh, maybe not. You know, it's it's hard when you're a young person, it's hard to know what you're going to need in your life 30 years down the road. That's very challenging. Um, it's partly for that reason that schools like the school I teach at have a required curriculum. OK, we just think you need some humanities classes uh, in your formation as, as a human person, 
even if you're going to go on to get an MBA or you're going to be a lawyer or whatever you do or a doctor, um, you need some humanistic opportunities to really think about your life. So we have core classes like many schools. And so we get students, many of whom are there because <clears throat> they have to be. Uh, and they, and it, this class fit their schedule and this is why they're here. And we have this precious moment with them where it's our job in some ways to help them see why it's good that they're here um, this semester or for a couple classes or whatever it might be. And how can we do that? I think from, and, and different teachers, there's a lot of ways to make this work, but I'll certainly say, at least speaking for myself, part of what my goal is, is to help them <clears throat> think carefully about where they are in life to see what their questions might be, to what they're unsure of in their future, and to see that, oh, I have these questions, and there is a way to think about them in a substantive way. And this class is an invitation, and I think the language of invitation is really important to us today. Let me invite you into this, this way of being that can change your life. Um, so it's an invitation to students to take seriously both their own life and, and what their future might be, and to show them that there are ways of thinking about this with, well, with rigor, but also with, with joy, um, and that can make them, to make them at peace in certain respects. I, I think every, there's a great little, and I don't remember where uh, Benedict XVI said this, but he said once that every young person desires to meet a great challenge and to overcome it in their life. They, they have this aspiration, this ambition, just as being a young person and, and wanting to do something, um, something that would make them proud with their life. It's a humanities class that helps them think about what that means and what shape that might take uh, and how they can be proud of themselves uh, as they go through their lives. Now, will we succeed at that? I hope so. Certainly sometimes. Uh, and it depends on, you know, can you pick the right books? It, is this book going to speak to all the students? Maybe not. Will it speak to some? Certainly. Um, it's an ongoing, in some ways, an ongoing um, developmental experience for every teacher to see what they can use to open up their students' lives in that way. Um, okay, I want to think maybe about the liberal arts tradition then and the virtues, uh, because in your description, there are a couple of points at which it seems like, you know, liberal arts tradition, um, it sets you up not to like succeed in general, but it sets you up to, you know, to ask the right questions and to endeavor the right goods, or at least to feel sufficiently certain and confident that when those challenges arise or when those obscurities or unclarities you know, present themselves, that you'll have the conceptual resources or that you'll have the life experience to, you know, stand firm or to, you know, overcome as you described it. Um, so I'm thinking especially about like wisdom and, and then fortitude on the basis of your description. I once had a professor at Steubenville who described like his first encounter with a great text and a great teacher. It was as if the fat was being trimmed from his brain, uh, which image I love. And I've returned to quite a few times, but it's like, we all have muddled thoughts about muddled things. And then when you hear somebody who's really wise speak with a vocabulary and a grammar that gives you the conceptual resources whereby to then kind of work your way through your muddled problem in your own muddled way with greater clarity and greater, you know, like kind of incisiveness. That's such a, that's so freeing. It's so empowering. And then thinking too about this, like this description of fortitude, which you gave, you know, we're all going to be confronted by challenges. And I think that, uh, in large part, uh, this generation is inhibited from attaining to a certain happiness by its fear of those challenges, right? Or by the false comforts, which are offered it, um, you know, that, that kind of protect it as it were, or insulate it from those challenges. But to think about the liberal arts tradition is furnishing you with like what you need in order to confront them, to overcome them, right? To persevere through them. Like what, what role, you know, like in, in your kind of experience of teaching it, your experience of learning it, you know, what role do the virtues play in equipping students of the liberal arts, you know, for their lives kind of in general, but for maybe some of these particular challenges that they encounter. Yeah, good. Let me say first, um, 
And I know I've already referred a couple times to St. John Henry Newman, so I'll, I'll do it again. Uh, his idea of a university, I think, is, is the blueprint for renewed Catholic education in the second half of the 20th, 20th century and into the 21st. And he, he was picking up on a, a long, an old tradition uh, when he said, in one sense, a liberal education or humanistic education, um, it, it's valuable for itself. It gives you this, um, it enlivens you in a rich way. It's not meant just to prepare you for, for a job of a certain sort. But then he also said, but it's the best job preparation you could have. Uh, and he was picking up probably the, the richest image of education we have in the Western tradition is Plato's the allegory of the cave in Plato's Republic. And in that, in that story, someone is at the bottom of a, a cave in the darkness and is slowly led up, up this steep incline, up into the light. And they don't want to go up there because when they get to the light, they can't see very well. <clears throat> it takes a while for their eyes to adjust. It's painful. It was comfortable down at the bottom of the cave with the shadows. Uh, but Plato has Socrates make this funny argument. He's like, well, why do you, why do you want to get out of the cave? And he says, well, you want to get out because it's going to make you good at, it's going to make you a good critical thinker. It's going to make you a good communicator. You'll, it'll make you a good soldier. It'll make you a good statesman. That is, it will give you the skills of communication and of, of careful thinking that are prized by any uh, employer and any vocation. And then he says, oh, yes, and by the way, it also gets you towards the light, as it does both. Um, so your question is about virtue, and that's not the same question as the practical life, the vocational life, and what a liberal education, how that prepares you for any particular vocation you might have. But I think they're connected. So the virtues, virtues do many things, but one thing they do is give you the skills necessary to navigate whatever situation you might be in. Uh, if you have genuine courage, genuine temperance, genuine practical wisdom, justice, then when you find yourself in a new situation and you don't understand it and you don't know what to do, you'll have the right instincts. That's what the virtues do for you. They, they, they allow you to make the right decision in circumstances that are unexpected and that put pressure on you in ways you never expected. Um, so how do you do that in the classroom? I mean, partly, you really have to give students examples. Um, that example that I gave you of the film, uh, Life is Beautiful, is the example of a virtuous man who uh, finds himself in a concentration camp and tries to protect his son. It's, it's, a, bit, it's a bit of a fable, as the opening uh, monologue suggests. Tries to protect his son who's with him and does so in a, in a remarkable way. How do you convey that to students? Well, with examples. I think also with um, the way that you are structuring a classroom. And again, this is another uh, uh, focus of, of John Henry Newman. Um, the relationship between a teacher and a student is like an intermediate relationship between their relationship at home, their home life, and the relationships they'll have when they graduate out in the world. It's a bit of a mentoring relationship. Um, it's like it's something like students at college, at universities, those those few years, both in the classroom and on campus, it's like they're practicing at life. Uh, they're living in a community. They're, they're they've got some work to do. They have these people in authority over them. <clears throat> some students say this is the best years of their life, partly because it's such a complete communal life uh, that they have trouble finding again. So what are they doing? In college, they're practicing at living. And the teacher has a particular role in encouraging the virtues in small ways, um, usually in small ways. Uh, a student who can, who can be brave uh, in an oral exam is a student who might be brave uh, in much more difficult circumstances. Yeah. Yeah, I am. Um... It's interesting, like when I look back at my time in college, I'm profoundly grateful for it. I went to Franciscan University of Steubenville, um, where I had a wonderful course of study, where I was kind of initiated into Christian friendships, uh, you know, outside the circle of my family for the first time in a, in a deliberate and intentional way. 
where I had imparted to me like a keen sense of the church's evangelical mission, right? Where the sacramental life was just bread and butter, you know, it was just, it was just part and parcel of your experience. And it's just like such a wonderful thing. But um, it's also not a place that I would necessarily want to go back to, you know, as a student. I mean, um, because there's a sense in which it was a time and that the time was limited, uh, whether perforce or by design. Um, so there's like, yeah, I think there's also this sense with, with an education that it ought to, yeah, it ought to send you. Um, it ought to project you into your future. Are there ways in which one, you know, crafts a curriculum or one instructs a student so as to communicate that, like not a kind of vague or Pollyanna-ish hope for the future, which can only be found beyond the bounds of this university. And so you got to, you know, step out and step forward, whatever. But like to, to communicate to somebody that like life lies in store and that life is, I don't know, furnished by a provident God who is good. And you may encounter a lot of pain and suffering, but there's still something to be had, something precious. But yeah. How do you, as a communicator, I mean, as a, as an educator, how do you in, yeah, how do you, how do you give this sense of what lies in store? Um, and, and cure people of a kind of nostalgia or backward looking, um, clinging, I suppose, or attachment to what was. I, I assume your next question will be, what's the meaning of life? I hope so. And so I'll be, I'll be prepping for that as I <laughs> answer this one. Uh, good. So let me, yeah, there's lots to say to this too. So I, you went to Steubenville. I went to Christendom College. Uh, okay. And a similar... There are similar um, challenges there. Christendom is a very rich community. Uh, there can be a temptation to long for that and not to find it and feel a little bit lost and not to know what to do uh, as a consequence of that. Um, that's partly because those place, places like Christendom, Steubenville, other schools, um, I think parts of Providence College are this way too, they're successful at giving students an integrated life. Um, integrated their intellectual life, their spiritual sacramental life, as you suggested, um, their social life. <clears throat> These things are related to one, an one another in a, in a rich way and in ways that many students will, will perhaps never find again. Um, the aspiration of the Catholic tradition broadly, not just educationally, but broadly, is to have an integrated life. And some of these schools, certainly what we try to do at Providence College, it's what we aim for, an integrated life, the spiritual, religious, where you're, you might have lunch with your professor, your professor's family might be at mass the other day. Um, so is there a bit of nostalgia when you leave that and you see that most of, most of, most of the world is not like that? It's not integrated in that way. It's quite fragmented in some very deep ways. Uh, you may work an hour from where you live, and that will structure all kinds of aspects of your of your life. Um, so is, is, is there some nostalgia? Yes, and I think actually properly so. There should be a way in which we see that integrated life, that, you know, it, and it's not perfect, of course, but to the extent that it succeeds, that it's a model for us, and it's, um, it's something beautiful and something good. Okay, but now your question is, how do you get students? It, this is this is sort of my question. Um, I want student. I want to promote as best I can uh, an educational home here at Providence College or wherever I might be that students love, that they look back on as a precious time of their life. I want that, but I also want them to go out into the world and to build something beautiful. Uh, and to be excited about that. I don't want my student in 20 years to say, the best years of my life were the four years at Providence College. That's actually not what I want. I want the best years of their lives to be later, when they're, when they're in the thick of things, when they have a family, when they're, when they're in religious life, when they're, when they're living as a mature human being. A college is preparation. So what's our, <laughs> how do we convey that to students? I mean, partly, We've got to show them that what they're doing in college is, uh, it's the beginning of something. It's, it's the preparation for something. Um, if they love what they see as a college student, let that be a model for them in their own lives of something that they can try to create and try to build. 
Um, and it's also, I mean, I'll say one last thing here. Um, college is an artificial place too. I mean, you have all these people who are all the same age. That's not, that's not the way life normally works. And those, that situation creates its own tensions, its own challenges, both for students and, and for others in the community. Um, and students can see that. So if you, you know, if, if you're like, look, this is a great place, but it's also a place of transition. Um, it's a place of preparation. And it has its own special challenges that are a reflection of that. And you're going to, I mean, if I could convince every student of this, I'd, I'd be so, I'd be delighted. If you can take what you see here that's good and infuse it into a full human life over the, you know, over the course of the next 20, 30 years, you will be happier then than you ever could be here. Boom. <laughs> um, that's wonderful. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for your patience in describing that. Thanks for your, yeah, yeah, care in detailing that. Um, as we kind of come to the end of our time, you know, often enough in a conversation, there are various things which kind of flit through your mind and you think, no, discipline the discourse. I'll talk about that at a later date or never. But any final thoughts, things that you want to communicate apropos of the humanities, a liberal arts education and the type of yeah vision and life, uh, which one can thereby experience, encounter and then and then live? Yeah, um, I, I think I'll just say something briefly. This is a very exciting time to be a Catholic intellectual to be part of the Catholic intellectual tradition. Uh, the Thomistic Institute is doing phenomenal work. Uh, I'm really proud of what we're doing at Providence College. There's these small colleges uh, popping up everywhere. There's all kinds of things happening at larger universities and institutions. There's things happening in the larger culture. Um, it's a time of great challenge, but it's also a time of really exciting things happening. Uh, and I would say to all, all those who are listening to us, um, share those with people. Uh, let people know. Um, so many people have their lives changed by listening to this person or going to this place. Um, give, give people an invitation. Bring them in to all this stuff that's happening. Great. Yeah. Um, well, thanks so much. Yeah, thanks for, thanks for making the time. And uh, I hope to, to see you up there in Providence before too long. I think I have an invitation from Father Edmund McCullough at Brown to give right. a talk at, uh, at Munderground. But I couldn't do it this semester, but hopefully next semester. So, yeah, I'll look forward to, to meeting you at the next occasion. Likewise, Father Gregory. It's a pleasure. Thanks. All right, turning to you, the listener, thanks so much for tuning into this episode of the Thomistic Institute podcast. Uh, if you haven't yet, subscribe on YouTube or on your podcast app. Uh, so that way you can get sweet updates when other things come out. Or, alternately, don't, um, because at the end of the day, it's better to have space for silence, space for contemplation, and if podcasts prove to be an obstacle, then flee. <laughs> so, know of our prayers for you. Please pray for us, and we'll look forward to chatting with you next time on the Thomistic Institute podcast.